Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Stories Written by a Current Prisoner. What's your favorite journalist, Tony? You already know. Bringing you exclusive interviews, exclusive testimonies from inside of California's most notorious prisons. Giving you an inside dive inside of the minds of California's criminals. Thank you for stopping by. From here until Christmas, it is going to be very busy. We're going to be dropping an oldie but goodie every single day until then. As well as a new video every day single day until christmas so if you haven't already please hit that subscribe button and please hit that like button for your boy grinding 24 7 man i'm telling you man what's about to go hard this month and as i stated previously we are close to that eighty thousand marker and as i stated man i promise you guys man, i got something juicy in the cut waiting for you guys man so you might as well hit that subscribe button right now with that being said ladies and gentlemen happy holidays how about them dallas cowboys Let's go ahead and waste no time whatsoever. This is a video visit and up until the 11 minute marker. You know, ask him a, a, a few new questions. And then at the 12 minute marker is the oldie but goodie, man. One of my personal favorite stories, the gladiator days at Cork. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, this happened 30 something years ago, 20 something years ago. It's not what it is today. With that being said, please hit that like button. Please hit that subscribe button. This is Dimas de Leon, former known as Diablo. Let's go. Mr. Dimas de Leon, sir, formerly known as Diablo, how are you doing, my good friend? I'm doing all right now. Uh, a great deal better than I used to do. Man, I sincerely appreciate you, man, for blessing us with your presence just one more time. You know, um, you know, Dimas, sir, and I mean no offense by this, man, but taking a look at your pictures, man, um, you know, the ones that you sent me, the ones that I've seen, you know, you're, you're a young man. You look... Uh, healthy you know you look 19 20 years old 30 years old i look at you now and um uh, you know like i said no disrespect but you are no longer that that younger man that this this prison sentence has 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 robbed you of your youth you know um how does that feel man when you look in the mirror and, and you and you see all these years just pass you by it's sad it's sad that uh that i have lost so much uh, it's sad that uh, it's sad that I deserve to be in prison, um, but yeah, it's robbed me of a great deal. I robbed myself of a great deal. You have to remember that I'm not in here because I'm an innocent man. I'm in here because I'm guilty of my crimes. So it's not that the that uh, life robbed me or that the system robbed me. It's that, that I robbed myself of these things. You know, uh, it's the choices that I made. It was the wrong choices. Whatever, whatever trauma I was going through, it doesn't really make a difference. I had the opportunity to change. I had people out there that were willing to help me. I just thought it was a cowardly act to ask for help or to accept their help. So I chose, uh, I chose what we believed uh, the hardcore life, the, the what we thought was a man life. You know, uh, proving myself to the wrong people, and it's, it was just our twisted way of belief back then. You know, alcohol. Uh, and violence uh this is what made you a man back then according to what we believed and anybody that didn't believe that way was a coward uh you know my uh, my opinion of all that has changed greatly since then you know uh, ladies and gentlemen for those of you out there who are actively participating in this lifestyle man take heed and pay attention to this gentleman's words man. i was 21 years old when i got locked up I am 58 years old right now. So I was, I, I spent 37 years straight in prison, um, straight. I spent 17 and a half of those years straight in shoe, uh, in isolation, where I spent tw 20, 23 and a half, 23 hours in, in a cell all to myself. I was only released for an hour of yard at a time. You know, so this is what it does to me, sure. Um, I am old now. I, I, I'm no longer that young, healthy individual. I suffer from a lot of uh, 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 arthritis. A lot of I'm, I'm going in for surgery soon for my knee because I have a torn uh, meniscus. I have pain from my shoulders down to my ankles. Uh, this is who I am now. It's nothing compared to the man I used to be or the youngster I once was. But again, it was my choice, you know? Life was hard. I, I chose a hard life. Man, take heed, ladies and gentlemen. You know, make that right decision, man, because there's, there's two choices in life, man. And uh, you can go down this road or 
You can go the other way. The other way is a family life, going to school, uh, being a productive citizen, man, uh, being there for your family, owning a home. That life right there sounds a hell of a lot better, man, than, than everything that, that you've endured, man, everything that you've experienced, all the pain that people can't even fathom. People can't even comprehend the amount of pain that someone such as yourself has endured, man. I don't think they even have an idea or a clue. I, I don't think they do. I don't think they understand what life is really like here in prison. Um, everything that you're giving up. We're talking about physical pain on a daily basis, 24-7. We're talking about emotional pain. We're talking about loss. I have lost a great deal of family, uh, a great deal of loved ones. Women have come in and out of my life, you know, and it's, it's, it's sad. Uh, I barely have any contact with my daughter who is, what, uh, 37 years old. She was born a month after I got locked up. So I've only been able to hold her twice in my life. I have grandchildren I have never even held yet. I barely get to see them once in a great while through, uh, through pictures or videos. But this is a loss. This is this, There's nothing about what the homeboys tell you about. This is what a man is all about. This is a, no, that life just sounds good. But I'm going to tell you something. Every homeboy that's telling you to do something is telling you to do it because he won't do it his damn self. It's because he doesn't want to wind up back up in here. This this is, I mean, I've endured violence. I've gone through the gladiator fights. And, and the gladiator fights were something ugly. Every 10 days I had to go out there and fight, get in a physical. And, and you don't know the emotional pain that you go through or the psychological pain pain that you go through let alone the physical pain that you have to go through from getting getting in a physical altercation and then getting shot at the same time for that physical altercation you know these fights were set up one against another just because you know we were from different sides of california nothing more than that dimas bro man now that you mentioned that would you able to would you be able to take us back man to to that very first time that you landed at Corcoran, man. And what was it like for you going into that cell, getting into your cellmate, him having to break it down to you? Hey, um, I don't know if you're aware of this, man, but, you know, we're, we're fighting right here, man. They're probably going to call you up. How did that whole thing play out? And, and when was your first experience actually going out there and, and having to handle business? See, people think that it all started in Corcoran Shoe. It didn't. It started in Tehachapi Shoe. It started in New Folsom Shoe. Once we heard about Corcoran Shoe opening up, we were preparing for it. We knew ahead of time that once we get there, we had to fight. We knew that we were going to be put on the same yard with the enemy. We just knew that. We, and, and we, it wasn't just that, though. So you had to get, your psycho, get yourself psychologically ready for a constant battle. But then we started to hear rumors about the new kinds of guns that they have, this new H&K rifle that, that the bullet goes inside you and blows up inside of you and you know and if you're hit above the waist you're, you're guaranteed to die if you're hit below the waist and the worst that can happen to you is you lose a leg or you're crippled and this is the things that we had to put our minds to we had to settle for this kind of psychological you know but it was all in the it was all in the in the in in, in the pride of being a gangster or what have you you know this is the kind of that we were fed with you know and we we bought into all this crap you know you have to remember that it was, it was us against the system. Back when I first got locked up, or most of us got locked up, if you had a life sentence, you were never getting out. You were stuck in prison forever. You were gonna die in prison. So you had this attitude, let's go for it. So, and that's the way it was. It was just, okay, let's go for it. So we were prepared for all this. The bus ride up here was a, it was, I mean, it was, you can't understand the emotion the emotions you're going through knowing that you're about to go to a yard where everything in it is going to be violence all all side for the minute you walk off the bus for the minute you get to a cell and you're hoping you get a cellie that's good that's not an enemy this is just the way it was back then i mean you get off the when i first drove you get off the bus and they put you up against the ball a bus and you're sitting and they're telling you the rules and they're, they're, they're not these little guys that you see now or these guys that are uh, overweight or no these are big old stocky ass monsters they're, they put you up against them. these guards were big they put you up against the wall and they tell you look this is the way it's going to be here and that's all there is to it and you have to sit here and tell yourself nah it's going to go my way not your way but you tell it yourself you know so you finally get to a to a cell and these cells were they weren't all that great and they were cold you know, get there and you're waiting 
need to go out to the yard to get you to find out who what you don't know who's in these sections next to you the cells next to you or nothing like that because everybody's being quiet you know so you have to sit there and observe and you watch a person go out to the yard and you're trying to read their tattoos see if they say north south or what hoods they has on it and stuff like that so that you can pinpoint whether it's an enemy or not you know and you get out there and the cops you see the cops walk up to the tower to the tower and they got the guns ready they're out there preparing the birth they're out there preparing the nine millimeter they're going through their own little their little routine about getting ready because they know something's going to happen so you automatically know something's going to happen so you go out there and my first day was i went out there with the homeboy we get out there and we're nervous you have to strip at the front gate you know you get naked you put you you, you you squat three times you cough you put your boxers on and that's all your life you're handcuffed you put in a sally port they take the handcuffs off and then right away they open the door, the door. You, gotta go out, you don't even have your shoes on yet so you go out there you go out there and the first day was me and homeboy and there was three individuals out there i'm nervous i'm going through it i don't know what to expect so I get out there, homeboy rushes one dude, I rush another guy, the other guy's in the shower, and it, it felt disrespectful that he's taking a shower knowing we're coming out. So I rush him, but we get into a big old fight, and then I rush the second dude that's in the shower as well. And that was nothing compared to way the guard, the guard staring down at us, yelling at us, calling us sense of, get down, you and he get crazy. He knows for a f it's, this is his first experience as well and the guns moving all over the place and you're like oh shit, this guy just gonna nut up and just shoot everybody you don't know so you're more scared now than anything else you know so this is what you're going through you know and it's nervous as fuck you're all clammed up you're all tight you know your muscles are tight you're thinking this might be your last day and, and, and it just goes off and finally everybody gets down um, and we get cuffed up and we're put back in the cell. Now, you have to wait 10 days before you go out there again and do it all over again. It's, 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 it's agonizing, the, 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 the emotions you're going through, this, the crap that you, you know, you have to sit here and tell yourself, okay, you're not going to die, but you don't know that for a fact. This guy could have shot me and killed me. You know, he could have shot me with Bertha. He could, there could have been all kinds of different things. The individual I fought could have had a knife. He could have had a razor blade. I don't know, but I went out there anyhow. This is a lifestyle we were living at that time. You know, this is just the way it was. Um, There's been a lot of people wondering about uh, the the transferring from uh, new from New Folsom Shoe to the Corcoran Shoe and how all that was going on. Well, in New Folsom Shoe, I was in B4 at this at the at this time. Prison prison was housing all NF and all Norteños with each other, and we only went out to yard with Africanos and other allies and others as our allies. The year was about December of '87. We had a big junta on the yard after our group workout. The NF who ran our building shoe yard which was Tibbs at the time, informed us that they built a new prison in, Cor in Corcoran for all for all of us and, they, and that they were going to mix us up with our enemies on that yard and that there there is that there will be no peace treaty with the enemy at all, that every opportunity we are to deal with our enemy no matter what, that the only way we're going to get out, get our yard back is if we force staff to give it back to us by going out there and fighting. He also stated that they were also transferring homies from Tehachapi, and so that we can recognize each other, we are all, we are all, all of us, to start getting an Aztec haircut, which was called the Mongolian at that time. Um, so everybody was instructed to get Mongolian haircuts. Tibbs cut my my hair into a diamond-shaped ponytail, which is why some carnales started calling me Diamond D. So we are all preparing for what is on its way. We are working out harder. We are learning how to hold razors in our throat so that we can cough them up later. The reason we started getting this Mongolian haircut was so that we can start promoting some cultural pride and unity. But the reality of it was that 
We only did it so that we could recognize each other, giving us the upper hand against the enemy. Another thing we did was send each other's names and numbers to others' homies' families so that we could stay in touch and pass info back and forth. It was also explained that we show no weakness, which meant that we do not ask for any medical help. If you're hurt bad enough, they'll know it, but we do not ask for it. We also spent a lot of this time visiting with our families because we didn't know what the outcome was going to be. Now, these cops keep throwing innuendos at us about this new gun and new bullets they were, they, that they made for this, for this, that they will be using on us. These cops are, are feeding us all kinds of info about the prison. We knew some of it would be true and some of it would be a bunch of bull. We finally get on the bus. Now, they see all of us from the norte at the back of the bus and all the vatos from down south in the front. And the blacks and whites are between us. It's tense on this bus. We have already been trained to be aware of, of any movement and of smells. I'm scared, but I can't show it. So I concentrate on any sudden movement and a, we're all... This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. We're also discussing who's going to sell up with whom once we get there. Well, me and another bro named Tomahawk from San Jose decide to sell up. We finally get there. This is, a, this is the dustiest pinta I have ever been in. There's dirt everywhere. Well, me and Tomahawk get sent to 4B3 left. We get into our cell, and we start calling out through our cell vent to our neighbors, but no one's answering us. But that's cool. Me and Tomahawk talk about what we, what we need to do. We, all we could do was go out to the yard, and if there's enemies out there, well, we know what, what we need to do. So just just so you know, there's three sections to each building, and we can't see who's in the uh, next section. Anyhow, they finally release the yard. Only three raza, only three other raza go out, and from their tattoos, we can see that they are sureños. So we now know that there will be at least three enemies on the yard before us. So this is how it starts. For me, first I I get I get all nervous. So we pump each other up, but I'm still nervous. My mind is blank. I'm not thinking of anything. I'm I'm so nervous, I swear others can see it. Anyhow, our door opens, so we walk down the section door and and do the routine. And the routine is that we get to the section door and we strip out. Now, I look back at all the cells, and everybody is at their cell door staring at us. So we cuff up, and they escort us to this sally port. The door closes behind us. There's two doors to two different yards. The yards are shaped like duck shoots at a fair. Okay, so the cuffs come off and the yard door pops. Now, my nervousness turns into this hot sensation. My entire body feels like it's on fire. We get out there and I put my shoes on. Uh, I tell Tomahawk, don't trip on the idiot that's in the shower. I got this, I got this one, you go at, you go at that one over there, cool? So I run at my, I run at the dude I, I, I asked, and so does, so does Tomahawk. I got this dude up against the wall. Then I see dude in the, in the shower starts to get, a, get dressed. So I run at him. By this time, the cuatero is screaming at us to get down. He's also cussing at us. I look over at him and he, sh he, he shoots Bertha at me. Then he grabs a nine, and I can see this fool is shaking and just aiming it everywhere. I don't think I can describe how scared that made me. Well, I got so scared it made me mad. I was like, stupid, don't they train you for this? He finally calmed down. The floor cops come out, the yard talking to me and Tomahawk, so they cuff us and put us in some cages. The nurse comes to see us, and we decline medical care like we're supposed to. We can tend to whatever, we can tend to whatever back in our own cell. I was too hyped up to feel anything. Plus, I'm still pissed that this cuetero panicked like he did. It was scary. I don't know if I can make you feel all the emotions I just went through in less than 15 minutes. It went from anticipation of, the, of, of at the worst, getting shot and killed, all the fear that produces 
that that produces to surviving a life-threatening encounter and all the relief that produces that, that that produces and then having to keep all those emotions to yourself so that you don't look weak. This was my first day in the in this arena. Now, this was the only time I fought the same opponent only once. After this, I fought the same opponent twice every time. They separated me in Tomahawk. I was sent to 4B1 left, which was considered bedrock. I landed in a cell next to Bandit out of Fresno, also NF. We already knew each other, so we, we used to sit at our doors and cut it up together, talk about any new filters, about other homies, where they ended up at. He had just got in a fight as well, so we were both on 10-day CTQ. While on CTQ, we went to law library to see who we could run into in order to gather info on what the program is supposed to be and find out where all the homies are at. And so we can find out what e what other homies we have in our building. We compile a list of all the homies in our building and whether or not they're living up to their responsibilities and who, if any, have locked it up. Now, time... You have 60 seconds Every remaining. Every time the section door opens, we go to our cell door to see why. Well, during one of these times, we see Cub from Fresno, a fellow carnal, move in, and we could see he had been shot with a 9 millimeter rifle. So we shoot him a kite, sending him our respects, asking if he needs anything, and wishing him the best in his recovery. He then sends us a kite telling us what happened to him and informing us that Chente from Chino was also shot in the hip and that he'll be okay. He's also instructed us that we are to pay close attention when we go out to fight, that once we are shot by Bertha, that we are to stop fighting and to get down, and that if we hear the Cuetero chamber around into the 9mm rifle, that we are also to stop fighting and get down, that we are to continue until one of these two things happen. This made things a little less intense. Not much, but some. But at least now we know a little more to go on. I'm also going to visit on weekends, so I'm gathering and giving homies we lives. Well, our 10-day CTQ is running out. Bandit's time is up, so in order to pump him up, I work out with him half an hour prior to the yard. They finally opened his cell for a yard. Things are tense again. You can feel It's like you can feel it in the air. That's how thick the tenseness is. He's led out first. I'm standing at my cell door to see who has to go, who he has to go against. They skip a few cells and let out the Sureño. So now I'm just standing at my door waiting to see how long it takes to jump off and to see if the Cuetero uses Bertha or goes straight for the nine. Well, it took about five minutes and the Cuetero used Bertha, which is great because that means that that's what he'll use most of the time. We have been informed about the bullets they are using, that after the bullet enters you, it blows up inside of you and shoots tiny BBs everywhere. We are also told that if we get shot above the waist, that we will die, and that if we get shot below the waist, we will, we will survive. So at least now we know that. We know what to expect. Yes, this is, this is, this is scary. This, this, this is scared out of me. But I wasn't going to admit this to anyone. So for 10 days, we worked out getting ready for our next fight. And we, and we, well, I prayed getting ready to die. These were, these were our only two honorable options. You either get ready to fight or you pray and get ready to die. That's it, nothing more. And during visits, we kept all this from our, our loved ones. My family, my mother would ask why we couldn't have contact visits. I told them that because I have XIV tattooed on me that they think I'm a gang member and, and so on. But this was, this was my life, and there was no way I could, I could have made them understand that. So it just became one excuse after another as to why I couldn't have contact visits with them. It was war and business up until they walked up to that glass window and grabbed the phone for a visit. For 90 minutes, 
I focused on them. Then as soon as they walked away, my life began again. Talking business and boring and praying I would make it to another weekend to visit. At first, living in such intensity was tiring. Day in, day out, our emotions were supercharged. At the end of the day, when the cops locked the bar lock, we knew at that moment we survived another day. We knew we could take our shoes off, that we could unroll our mattress and rest and sleep in comfort. This was what life was like for us. I was I was next. My 10 days were up. So I walk to the section door, go through the strip search routine. I get out to the yard. I hurry up and put my shoes on. I do some push-ups. I'm waiting for my opponent. But to my surprise, he brings Bandit out again. I tell him, what's going on? What's the deal? He's surprised as well as I as well. Well, then the yard door pops open, and here comes this Sureño named Jojo. I forget what city he was from. I let it, I let dude put his shoes on, and then he calls me over and tells me, hey, he wants to, t- he tells me he wants to talk to me, and he squats against the wall. So I told Bandit, just chill. I walk over, and I squat facing him. He starts talking, and he tells me, look, Diablo, these cops are, are itching to kill one of us. So as soon as the, he tells me, so as soon as the Cuatero thinks nada is going to happen, I'll rush the both of you. I almost broke out laughing. Instead, I tell him, okay. He started to say something, but as I was standing up, I cracked him with a left uppercut. His jaw popped so loud, it was like, what? I thought they, they had shot already. So anyhow, the Cuatero shoots me with Bertha in my chest. It hurt. It actually sat me down on my ass. He grabs a nine and is yelling at Jojo to prone out. Then he chambers around. Well, before I knew it, I'm yelling at the cuetero. I'm telling him, he's out. He can't hear you. He's out. The cops rush out to the yard, put us all in cuffs. Well, after that, after that, 10 days later, Jojo got released out to yard first. This time, I'm holding a razor in my throat. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. I got it right there in my throat, ready to come out. Again, my emotions are are intense, especially my fear. So I get out to the yard. The cop barely gets my cuffs off as Jojo is running at me. I cough up the razor and swing it at Jojo's face. He sees it and stops. Well, it gets stuck in the collar of his shirt. He's backpedaling, and I'm trying to yank the razor free and punching him in the face with my right hand. Well, I got shot with Bertha in the back of my head. It kind of dazed me. So I let go of the razor and proned out. After this second fight, I was moved to another section. I'm the only NF or no As I was saying before, I can't lose these fights. It's okay to lose it to a Sureño or a regular white boy, but I will never hear the end of it if I lose to an MA or an AB. Yes, this is the pressure we lived under, not to mention death on top of that. There's fights going on every day, seven days a week. There's two in the morning and two in the afternoon in every building, and there's, there's eight buildings, and that was only on B yard. The same was going on on A yard. So, yeah, that's a lot of Bertha shots. It, it must have got expensive because they started charging us for the, the gunshots they used on us. Well, my 10 days is running out. This time, Chewy Selly goes out to the yard. He's also in it. So I go out, and again, all these emotions are on edge. My body feels like it's on fire. But I guess I've adapted to the lifestyle because I'm no longer nervous. I'm still feeling fear, but it's a different kind of fear. The fear of death or pain is no longer there. The only fear I now feel is of not representing well. So now my attitude has changed. I'm more careless now. So I get out to the yard. He lets me put my shoes on, and then we go at it. Yeah, it's, he, he tagged me pretty good. He tagged me on the forehead. We went at it for what seemed like an hour. But in reality, it could have only been a few minutes. This time, I didn't get shot. Um, it hit him, it, he got hit with Bertha. 
he he did, and that that moment, that's all that really mattered to me. The fact that the fact the fact that he left his big ass welt on the left side of my forehead didn't matter. It's funny how we hold on to these little small victories. But yeah, he's the one that got shot, and I felt good about that. Well, because of other fights, it took longer than 10 days before I made it back out to the yard or out to the arena. By this time, we had already heard that Palo from Sacra was shot and killed in New Folsom Shoe. Yeah, I knew him. He was a dumb brother. And they also shot and killed Snowman. I think he was from San Jose. He only had like two weeks left before he went home, and they shot and killed him. But the but the homeboy should have never let him go out to go to out to yard anyhow, being that short. Well, you start hearing the commotion in the in the control booth. So they they're they're expecting a good fight. I'm ready just in case my door opens. Well, I see Chewy and his Sally going out to yard, so I know it's me. I I know it's my turn now, and I know it's going to be two against one. Hey, that's life. There's nothing you can do about it. Those are the rules. The cops are laughing, just having a good old time about what's about to happen. So I get out to yard, and I hear Chewy. I hear Chewy tell his Sally, I got this one. I rush Chewy. As we're trading punches back and forth, I'm trying to keep my eye on, on his Sally in case he runs in. And then I finally got tired of trying to keep my eye on him, and just as he shot just as he shot Bertha at Chewy, I rushed, I rushed his Sally. I turned to go at his Sally, and I get shot with Bertha. I want to keep going, but that's two shots. The only reason I wanted to keep going was because I, I had a bloody nose and a busted lip, and I couldn't let that go. But, like I said, that was two shots. There's no telling what else from Bertha I would have been feeling. So we're cuffed again. We all refuse medical care, and sure enough, the control booth gets busy with everybody wanting to see the video. It's funny how they all just run up there like ants just to see a video about a fight. That day, these two cops come to my door and hand me two extra lunches, and they thank me for making them richer. I tell them, these lunches, share that money with me. They, don't, they only laugh and move on. The only other member I went up against was Danny Boy. I don't know where Danny Boy was from. Now, Danny Boy had a good history. The first time I heard about Danny Boy was back in 87. I had just got to Old Folsom when Danny Boy had killed somebody on the, in, in the cell or his celly, one or the other. I think it was in Building 3. Anyhow, that was how he was made as a member. So I know he's got to be about something. So now they take me from C section all the way over to A section just to fight him. So he must have been winning as well. By now, I'm no longer feeling anything. It isn't any big thing anymore. It's strange how we as humans can adapt to anything. And earlier I had said that I had only fought one, one guy once. Well, I was wrong. I also only fought Danny Boy once. Anyhow, I walk out to the yard, and you can see Danny Boy was expecting someone else. We both know we're enemies. He knows because anybody with a Mongolian haircut... This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Anybody with a Mongolian haircut is ranked somewhere in the Norteño car. Anyhow, I walk out, and we start getting into it. Well, he connects pretty good, and I can feel myself going down. So I reach out for anything to grab, something to hold on to. Sim simply by chance, I grab his shirt. So now I'm pulling him down on top of me. See, this, this fool is strong. So he squats a little and is now holding, holding me up. So I start swinging with my left hand. I hit him about four times when they finally shoot Bertha. I get a few more in, and I hear the cuatero chamber around into the nine. So I let go of his shirt, and we prone out. They cuff both of us up, escort me all the way back to C-section. But, yeah, that was the only time I fought Danny Boy. There's two things about that fight that I have that has stuck with me. One, this fool has some strong-ass legs. You figure he had to hold himself up, plus me, off the ground, and while taking my punches as well. But more importantly, he had the upper hand. All he had to do was start swinging. He could have f***ed me up, but he didn't. Why? I don't know. Well, maybe one day I'll be able to ask him. 
Now, I've had a bunch of fights before, between, and after these fights. In fact, my best fight was against this little white boy. I really don't want to fight him because he's so small. But, hey, rules are rules. This was when I was in 4B1 left. So I go out to the yard. I walk up to him, and I crack him hard. At least I thought I would crack him hard. But he turns around and cracks me right back. So we start going at it. Even the Hudas were surprised and shocked. I don't know his nickname, but his last name was Huede or something like that. And, yeah, I fought him twice. I, I even looked forward to the second fight. And, yeah, it was just as good as the first one. Both times we walked off that yard bloody. Now, I went through this for two years. Every day, your, so, your cell door opened for a shower, for a law library, or even for a visit. You stepped out of your cell expecting the worst. No one, for any reason, got a break. If they let your ass out for church and the enemy was also let out, well, business comes first. So you better be ready. You put your shoes on early in the morning. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. You put your shoes on early in the morning, and they didn't come off until after 10 p.m. My very last fight in Gorko Shum was against an A.B. wannabe. He had finally man- we had finally managed to have our own yard in 4B4 left. There were three of us, three of us in F and about four structure, and the rest were Norteños and Africanos. Well, Shorty from Hollister, and I forget where Rock was from, they're both in F. They both had the yard at that time, so it was all good. Anyhow, the night before, this tall, skinny white boy moves into our section, and he introduces himself as Slim. And he starts talking to a couple Sureños on the tier, talking about these busters, referring to all Norteños. So we're on the yard. We make it out to the yard. Everybody is out there, including this white boy. I asked Shorty if he has a plan to deal with this. He says, yeah. Now, I know I have a visit, so I'm not going about to do much of anything. Shorty tells me the homie is going to take care of it. Time passes in nada. So I get at Shorty again. I'm mad now. I tell him, Shorty, why is this dude still on my yard? Shorty gave me a weird look because he noticed I just claimed his yard. With this, but he tells me, don't trip. Africano volunteered. I told him, look, if I have to deal with this, then you're going to answer for it. Well, needless to say, I didn't wait much longer. The white boy co-cocked me because he knew I was coming after him and dropped me to one knee. Well, I jumped up and dropped him, but I didn't let him get away with it. I jumped right on top of him. I stayed on him. I think I lost it for a little bit because the Cuetero's first shot was with the 9 millimeter, but I didn't hear it. But I sure enough felt the second shot. It hit me right in the leg. It was painful. So this Africano behind me tells me, you've been hit, Diablo. I reach down, and sure enough, there's nothing but blood coming out of my leg. So we all prone out. Then they finally called out my name and told me to walk to the yard door. I was in a lot of pain, but I couldn't sh- show it. So as I'm getting up, I tell this Norteño that I expect him to file a report to the Carnales. So when I get to the yard door, they actually make me strip out. I couldn't believe it. I had to strip out and squat three times, put my boxers back on. But I did it instead of complaining. It wouldn't have done no good. So every day in the morning, this is what we go through. Before a fight, my prayers are said. I say goodbye to my daughter. I say goodbye to my baby's mama, to my mother, and to my brothers and sisters. Then I come back from I come back from yard all bruised up and spend the rest of my days getting ready to do it all over again. I did this for two years until finally I got shot, crippled, and sent to the bay. But again, before this, there was this one time I get this youngster off the line for a celly. I tell him who I am. Yeah, I tell him, look, I'm Diablo and I'm NF. So he tells me, look, Diablo, I'm Casper, I'm from TC, and I'm a Norteño. So I, gave him, I say, okay, cool. I give him the household policies, and I tell him that we got yard in the morning and that we're going to go out there until they go out there and deal with these Sureños until they shoot Bertha at us. He says he's down. Needless to say, it didn't work out that way. The next day, I got him going. I got him doing burpees at 8:30 to get ready for the yard. Well, at 9 they open our door for yard. Well, this fool runs past me to the section door. 
the cuetero hits the alarm, points a nine at me, and tells me to prone out. I, you have 60 seconds remaining. I prone out, but I just can't hold it in. in, in. I break out laughing. It was so surprising that it was, it was funny. so surprising that it was funny. After they get rid of dude, even the hudas laughed. And I look back at that incident and wish that would have been me. Maybe I'd be home by now if that would have been. Then there was my sponsor into the NF, Dopey from Staton. Anyhow, he's in the cell right above me, so we're able to talk to each other and just cut it up through the vent. Well, he's scheduled to go out and get into go out to the arena at 1 p.m. So he calls he calls me to the vent to complain about getting shot in the back all the damn time that he's tired of it. So I tell him, look, fool, this is what you do. You go out there when you guys start fighting, maneuver dude so he's between you and the cuetero. That way he's the one that catches the gunshot and not you. That's all you have to do. So I pump him up with words and all. Uh, so now he's ready to go. They open his door and he heads out. He heads out there. The whole section gets quiet. Yeah, so we can hear the gunshot. Yeah, and it doesn't take long. The alarms go off. The gun goes off. So both my celly, oh, I think I think his name was, uh, I think that was um, uh, Coyote from Corco. He was my celly. He's also NF at the time. And um, so we're standing at the door waiting to see how our carnal did. The Sureño comes in first. He don't look too bad. And then here comes Dopey, looking like the elephant man. The whole side of his face is swollen. His eye is swollen shut. I break out laughing because I know what happened to him. Yeah, it's his his stupid luck. This guy not got shot in the face. He gets in his cell and calls me to the vent. He's yelling at me, telling me, talking all kinds of me like it's my fault. But I can't stop laughing. I'm even clowning him and he's yelling at me. He eventually starts laughing as well. I'm laughing now, remembering it. I'm I'm laughing right now, just remembering it all. But yeah, that's how callous we had become of each other's pain, let alone our own. The gladiator fights continued way after we were sent to the bay. Some staff finally got tired of it and gave it all up. But CDCR, being the biggest and most powerful gang in California, won the lawsuit against them. But some inmates did settle out of court and were able to make some money. But most didn't. The hudas that gave everything up can't even get a security job nowadays. There's a few other hudas I see from time to time that I remember from those days still working. I hope I was able to show you what it felt like to barely live. Yes, I know a lot of this lost the emotions behind it because I was reading what I wrote. But if I hadn't written a lot of this stuff out, I wouldn't have remembered it. Remember, this happened between 88 and 90 for me. Plus, I only have 15 minutes of call. Now, if I had the opportunity to talk to you directly with no time limitations or other obstacles, I'm sure you would have heard the difference. And maybe when either this pandemic is over or they finally let me out, we can do this then. But I truly hope these words behind concrete stirred a little thought, if nothing more. you got to remember, this is a life I lived a while back. I've been now on this site for a minute, and I haven't had to go through these emotions since then. But if you could see me, you would understand the emo- I still bring up these emotions, and I can still feel the pain. I can still feel the loss. I can still feel the fear from those days. Am I traumatized? Sure, to some degree. Will I get past it again? Sure, to some degree. So, but that's the gladiator fights. If you have any questions, yes, sir.